why do we have to make the same mistakes as everybody else? I don't understand the world, how it operates in this manner. Like we see the same thing repeating itself over and over and over. And it's just like to me, well, why aren't we learning from those mistakes so that history doesn't repeat itself yeah. so that we could do things a little bit smarter or better? And I think I've been able to at least learn from my my ancestors in the sense of fighting, mm-hmm. learn from these guys, the forefathers and things that they did, things that worked. And now, Escaping the Drift, the show designed to get you from where you are to where you want to be. I'm John Gafford, and I have a knack for getting extraordinary achievers to drop their secrets to help you on a path to greatness. So stop drifting along, escape the drift, and it's time to start right now. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Escaping the Drift. And I got to tell you, man, I know I say this every single week, every time I come in here that I say I got a banger, but today I got a banger. So today's guest is somebody that normally, dude, you hear this dude get introduced. Somebody's about to get their ass whipped. But today, hopefully we're not going to do any ass whipping. We're just going to do some talking. So this cat is the most decorated bantam heavy or sorry bantam weight champion in UFC history. He has more uh, consecutive wins, more title defenses, just just all around unbelievable badass and a great dude. From what I I know, a couple of people that are really really tight with this cat, and they just do not say one bad thing about him. They say the the greatest things about him. So we're happy to have him here, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Funk Master. This is Aljamain Sterling. Aljo, what's up, buddy? How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Super happy to have you in studio today. So you got a cool story, man. You uh, I mean, obviously, when you reach the levels of success that you've had through athletics, it is it's not by accident. There's definitely clues that you've left along the way and things that you've done. So, but I always like to start at the beginning, right? So tell me about growing up, Aljo. Tell me about you, man. Tell me about the, the, the where, where you started. Uh, where I started, I grew up in Roosevelt, New York, Long Island. And mm-hmm. then I moved over in middle school to Uniondale High School. That's where I graduated. Uh, I wrestled there. I played a lot of different sports. Um, growing up, we played a lot of pickup sports like basketball, football, um, racing each other down the streets and things like that, playing some pickup baseball and soccer as well. Mm. And when I got to high school, I got a little bit more discipline, like trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I found wrestling. I, I tried out for the basketball team, but that was my first love. And I came up short in the tryouts. I made the first day, second day I got cut. And uh, my wrestling coach forced me again, came to me and said, listen, you're never going to be nothing but five foot four soaking wet, 112 pounds, come out and wrestle. <laughs> so I came out and wrestled, checked it out. It was a fun practice and uh, I haven't stopped since then. Um, I used that to take me to college and uh, somehow, some way I, I met John Jones and then the next thing you know, I'm fighting in the UFC. You're fighting. <laughs> That's kind of a quick jump though, man. So like my question is, obviously you had a heavy competitive edge to you growing up. Like you like, you like to compete. It was something yeah. that was in you. Is there something you got from your parents? Is it something you got from a mentor growing up? Like who was the person that you think instilled that in you? Um, comp- mm, that's a good question. I never thought about that. Where did I get the competitive edge from? Uh, well, maybe because I had so many siblings growing up, we had to fight for everything, <laughs> fighting for food, for seconds, fighting for there's the seven, there's, there's seven of you in the, in the house with 12 total extended, right? Uh, 12 total extended. Yeah. I guess you, you include the parents and then the rest, it would be about like 10 of us. 10 at of time. you. Yeah. Where did lot. you, where did you fall in the pecking order as far as age with that? I was like the, I mean, that living at the house with my brothers and sisters at that time, um, what did I say? My sister, brother, I was fourth. You were fourth. Yeah. But then with my other side, I would be six, actually seventh, including my to my older brothers and sisters on the other side. Okay. So it was a lot of us. Was there was a lot of you. Yeah. yeah. What did mom and dad do? Mom, my dad was a street pharmacist. And, uh, (laughs) that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And my mom was a, um, uh, I guess kind of a stay at home mom. She, she did like a lot of different odd jobs. Like she was working at a hair salon for a little bit. Uh, she helped my dad. Um, and 
Pretty much a stay at home mom. That's pretty much her job. Pretty much. We'll do. I mean, that's with that many kids. Yeah. That's a full time deal. A, it's a lot. I mean, she was almost pregnant every single year, like back to back. Yeah. That, so. That's a, that's a lot. When you went away to college, had any of your other siblings done that or were you the first? I had my older sister, Laverne. She went to college first. Um, I went second, but I was the first to finish. Uh, I think she ended up finishing like later on, but I was the first to finish. And then my other younger brother on, on the same side and my mom and same dad, um, we went to SUNY Corlin. But yeah. that, that was pretty much our introduction to school. And it, it was through wrestling because the NCAA Clearinghouse, once I learned what that was and I realized I had no shot in getting in, I tried to like turn it around. After my ninth, year, my ninth grade year, I just kind of, he just kind of be a little bit of a, just, I don't know, I don't know if you you get a lot of curse on here or not. Yeah, but yeah you can say whatever we, you want. We, we fucked off a lot, you know, so, <laughs> right, yeah, it, it just wasn't good. So by the time I realized, and for wrestling, in order to go D1, and I realized this is what I wanted to do, um, I tried to see and look at all the schools and stuff, and I saw the grades and everything, the classes I needed, and I was like, bro, I... I'm not getting in. Yeah. You know, so I, I had to figure out another way, which was either to go to Juco school or I went to another D3 school, SUNY Mooresville, mm. upstate New York. I went there for a year for an accountant major. Then I was when I figured out I didn't want to do that anymore, I switched to phys, phys ed, but I tried to take the classes that would transfer over to my course. Otherwise, just like wasted electives and wasted time in school. You're just paying all this money for nothing. Yeah. Um, and that's when I went to Cortland eventually. Right on. So where did you meet John Jones? SUNY, did, SUNY Morrisville. You met him? He was there? Yeah. He had his own issues at Iowa Central College where he was a <laughs> uh, national champ his first his freshman year. Then I guess the second year he came back. I guess he had some issues with the school and he, he dropped out. Ended up coming to SUNY Morrisville for a semester. Um, next semester, I just didn't see him. I didn't really know what he was doing. I just followed him on MySpace, see yeah. some of the stuff he was posting and he was doing these grappling matches. I thought it was pretty badass. I've always seen it on TV. I just never knew this was like, there was an avenue to get here. I thought it was just kind of like, you, you got to know somebody to, yeah. to do this. And he was doing jujitsu matches. I reached out to him. I saw him taking a couple of fights. I was like, yo, bro, I, I want to do that. I think I could do that too. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty much exactly <laughs> what I said. And he was like, no, you don't. And I was like, I'm telling you, that's what I want to do. He t and uh, he told me where his gym was. And when he gave me the address... It was in SUNY Corlin. It was at Corlin. It was where like you were in the same town. Where you were training pretty much yeah. a couple miles away. Yeah. So I was like, dude, this is a no brain. I went down there. I just I haven't looked back since then. So here's a question, man. Do you think that because like if you look at if you look at college athletes, I think that like if you look at the like foot, D1 football athletes, yeah. right? They have a fucking mass of people that just keep them out of trouble and <laughs> just make sure that they're on the right way. Did you I'm guessing at wrestling, they didn't really have that mass of people to keep you out of trouble. No, nah, no, nah, not like that. I mean, no. I still hung out with the guys I hung out with. Like some of my friends, I had some good friends and I had a, a group of friends that weren't necessarily straight, in, your, in your best arrow. interest. Yeah, in yeah. In your best interest, we'll say. You know, it was take this path or take this path. Yeah. And one of my brothers, the, my older brother, he was actually blood. He still is. <clears throat> Um, so he was heavily involved in gangs and, uh, you know, I almost went that route with him, you know? So it was one of those things, like I had this group of friends who were like, you know, they're cool kids still, but not involved in that type of stuff. And then I had my other friends over here who were involved in that type of stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, when you want to hang out with big bro all the time, it, you kind of get a little bit mixy with that. So yeah, life was uh, very interesting growing up. Very I, I, I can, I can see that at what point, I mean, obviously this is going to skip forward a minute or whatever, but at what point did you kind of say, Hey man, I can't really hang out with, with you guys anymore. Like I, I got to draw a line there. I mean, is that something where you still get kind of like go home and like see some guys from back in the day and it's, you know, you're still good. Now I'm not sucked into the life, but you're still, yeah. I mean, where are you with that? Cause some people, man, have to like draw a hard line. Some people can still drift back and forth. Like, where are you with that? I, I think the good thing was I never made a full commitment to that life. So yeah. I, it's, it wasn't really something that pulled me back. Um, Cause I saw, I still had the flexibility to kind of been like, I could do this or I could do that. Mm. And it wouldn't be any like negative repercussions or anything like that. Um, 
And I, I think for the most part, I was pretty friendly with everyone in high school, even with the rival gangs. Like, it, I never really had, like, you're a nice guy. <laughs> There's yeah. no reason for me to have yeah. an issue with you, you know? Yeah. The only issues I would ever have is when my brother would get into some stuff. And, uh, and I wasn't very big, man. So I was just like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? When my brother's not around, what, what am I going to really do? This little kid who wrestles at 112 pounds, walks around about 119, 122 pounds, soaking wet. Like, what's that guy going to do against some of these big giant guys that are walking around yeah. with these flags on? Like, this is is just different. It was a different time back then, you know? So um, for me, to, I didn't really draw a line, but I knew where I wanted to go. And I was to go to college so that I can wrestle. Because I came up short in high school. And I knew if I went to college, I had another opportunity to get another four years to all American. Cause I never got to go to States in high school. I was ranked in the state my senior year. I beat the kid that beat me for the last match. I beat him twice earlier that season. And then he beat me when it mattered the most. And he got to qualify yeah. and, and it was in the finals county championship finals. And I didn't get to go. Dude, I find that really interesting because and I'll tell you why. I mean, even at a very young age, it's like you kind of, it seems to me like you were good at setting goals for yourself and understanding where you were trying to go and how to get there. I mean, it seems that way. Well, not in the beginning because okay. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. But then once I realized with college, with through wrestling, the only way to get there was, well, to have this, you got to do that. Yeah. And that was the po- that was the turning point that helped me kind of navigate which way I wanted to go. Because before it was just kind of like, yeah, I'm just going through, the, going through the motions. My dad does what he does. If anything, I could always join the family business and- Maybe that's like the avenue I take, but somehow, some way wrestling, I, I really say this all the time, but I know it's a little cliche, but I really do feel like wrestling saved my life. Like it, it really yeah. changed a whole lot of things for me, my perspective on life, what I wanted for myself. Um, Cause then when you have this guideline, this bar, you can't get there doing all the other stuff that I was doing. So I had to get my grades up in order for me to even get any type of looks from schools and thankfully, it allowed me to at least go to Mooresville. I mean, there was almost no barrier to entry to go there. But <laughs> but thankfully, I went there with a the goal in mind, and it was to transfer. My yeah. goal was to get here, bring my grades up. Um, I got a fresh slate. Yeah, It's not like my ninth grade year where I just had like 60s and 65s. Yeah. So now I get an opportunity to actually apply myself and uh, get good grades. And I surprised myself. I was like, okay, you're actually smarter than... What you give yourself credit well, for, you well, just got to. Well, I have a feeling about you when, when it comes to that, right? Because obviously, dude, I, I I see you and I know the guys you hang out with that I at least know. And, okay. and, and they're not hanging out with somebody that's dumb. <laughs> so my guess with you is you're that kid that could probably pretty much without even looking at a book, get like a B or something on a test, but never turn in one page of homework, which I, caused you to get like D. Yeah. Is yeah. that fair? That's, that's fair. <laughs> if, if I had some notes to kind of study real quick, I could. Yeah. Hang it out and just memorize everything and I'm good. I'm good in that front, but come to like the other stuff, I, I just struggled a little bit. But uh yeah, thankfully it worked out, man. The res- wrestling really yeah. did give me that avenue, gave me a platform and gave me direction. I think that's the most important part. When you know where you want to go, um, I think it makes things a lot more clearer because then you can write out your goals. And that's when I started to do that. You it, really so now you're putting pen to paper. How old is this in college? This is in high school. High school. My senior year. So I knew what I wanted to do when I got to school. And then when I got to school, then the, those goals kind of changed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I gave myself like a little bit of a a loose kind of like goal sheet of w- what I want to do, and what I want to accomplish. And I knew if I at least hit that, I was in striking range to at least transfer out and go to a D1 school or another college. So what made like, I think that's so interesting, though, because I mean, where did you like what made you think to write the goals down? Like what, like what made you, I mean, most kids at that age are not thinking like that, especially if they don't have like a heavy role model influence. It's, you know, here's read this Tony Robbins book. Let's do that. Like they're not, they don't get that. that. (laughs) Get any of that. So so where, so where did that come from, man? Um, I'm trying to think now because I I never really get asked these questions. I never even think about it. I, I think it's, um, man, it's hard to really say. I, I, I just feel like it was more of, um, there's one thing I always did do. It was when it came to money, I was good at budgeting, uh, understanding ex- like expenses and stuff like that. And I got that from accounting my senior year when I took that class. Mm. And that's why I went to school for accounting. Cause I was like, Oh, this is something I'm actually into. And I think I could be pretty good at it. 
And I started writing stuff down because then when you start budgeting, you're almost like indirectly writing goals and knowing like what your expenses are, what you're willing to spend and how much money you could play around with kind of thing. Uh, so I kind of took that and I think maybe that's probably what it was. I don't think there was anything else that I really looked to like, yeah, you should probably write out your goals. Uh, maybe the teacher, the, 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 maybe said that the blackboard, when she makes us write the same thing over and over a hundred times all the way across, uh, maybe one of those, yeah. I'm get, just getting into trouble at the school or something like that. Yeah, I'm guessing you're still a goal. You still write your goals down today. hundred percent. hundred percent. I had one post that did really, really well. I didn't think anything of it. I just like to share stuff. Cause I think on social media, you see a lot of things that's like fabricated, you know, it's more, no, this is the glitz no. and glamour. Everything's real. That red, yeah. that red Lambo is totally real. Yeah. Hacho. Come yeah. on, man. hundred <laughs> percent. This is what people think though. You know, it's, you know, their reality is their perception, you know? So people see these things and they think it's just like, this is all what it is. And they kind of use that and they judge themselves and what they have and don't have. And I feel like, um, being able to show my vulnerability kind of lets people understand like, it's okay, man. Even when you're at the highest high, what well, people might think my life is all this amazing. I got so much crap in my shed, in my, my dog house that I, I'm trying to clean out to, to kind of liberate myself that I have going on behind the scenes that nobody knows about that. Yeah. I don't really talk about that type of stuff, family stuff, you know, siblings, parents, divorces, like all, all kinds of craziness, man. So um, I like to show that there are other things that go on besides the just perfect image. Cause it's never like that, man. This yeah. it, it really isn't. And I think me sharing those goals, it helped a lot of people because I posted my goals from 2019. And uh, I think I posted that maybe a year ago. And it was, I guess it was just very relatable for a lot of people to see someone who was knocked out badly, mm -hmm. came back and did all these things where most people wrote me off and gave me no shot. But I just told myself, this is what I plan to do. And the only way to do it is, so get I there. put the work in and, and that's it. You know, so John Jones, let's go back to that. John Jones tells you to go to the gym. You're like, it's right here where I'm at. So you go to the gym and who's your first mentor in the gym there? Because now you're learning a different skill. You go from learning gra grappling to learning jujitsu. Yeah. Is this, this is when you went that way. Yeah. Jujitsu, yeah. boxing. Yeah, yeah. Learning All those how to things. throw a punch. Yeah. <laughs> the you, right way. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. <laughs> now the stuff I see on TV. Um, my first mentor there, I mean, it was kind of John, but not really because – I didn't really see him all that often. I had class. I was still in school. Mm -hmm. um, I was still wrestling at a high level. And in order for me to go there, I had to go around the off season or after a workout from the gym, like the practice, and then try to eat real quick and then try to run to the, to the training room. So it was really crazy. And that was just the dedication I had. I went through a full two hour practice, go eat something small or something big, and then take the leftovers. And then I go run to the gym and go do some grappling MMA training just because I was just curious and infatuated and, and just uh, infatuated with what it was. Cause I just wanted to see if this was something I could do. Did you fall in love with the grind pretty quick? Oh, I mean, it was very relatable to wrestling. So yeah. you get in what you put in. That's what I love about combat sports. You legit get in what you put in. There's no secrets. Yeah. You could, this could be another guy who could be a bit more talented, but if you work hard, if you're smart enough and you come up with a good game plan, you could kind of, tilt the, the scales back in your favor a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of level the, the playing field, especially if that person who's talented doesn't really work as hard. You know, it, it's funny <clears throat> talking about athletes and how they look at things. And, and I was at a, in a small group the other day and when Marshall Falk was there talking to us and he said something that I never thought about with pro sports, with all the, all the people I've heard speak or have talked to. And he said, what it takes to be great. We're talking about the NFL and he goes, what it takes to be great in the NFL. He goes, you have to remember every dude that has a roster spot on an NFL team was the dude at one point on in a team, school, yeah. either on high school or in college, they were the baddest dude on their team. And so the dude that's your third string backup behind you at one point was the man. And he goes, what it takes to be great in the NFL is you have to realize there's rooms with inside the room, inside the room. And we're like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, look, like, look at me. He goes, Make it the league's a big deal. He yeah. goes, and then there's Hall of Famers. That's the room you want to be in. I was like, yeah. And he goes, but there's another room. Then there's first ballot Hall of Famers. And then there's first ballot Hall of Famers that also won a Super Bowl. And then there's first ballot Hall of Famers that also won a Super Bowl that were also league MVP. 
He goes, that's a pretty small room for us. Yeah. He goes, but I was always looking for that room. Yeah. So from when the, the point I'm getting to when I make this is when you first started out, was it always like as soon as you kind of fell in love and saw that you could do this in this gym, were you immediately thinking, I'm going to I'm going to UFC. This is where I want to go. You know, I thought of it more like uh, as a hobby. And then I was like, you know, I'm young. I'm going to roll the dice and just see what happens. I'm going to get my degree to make sure worst case scenario, I have something to fall back on mm -hmm. and it's going to be no harm, no foul. It's just, I tried something that I always was interested in. Um, the next level from fighting has always been the less, the next level from wrestling has always been fighting. Yeah. So whenever you want a match or lost a match, you always kind of had that, like that macho man, like, <laughs> I want to know if I could beat him in a fight, even yeah, if you beat me in a fight. match, you just want to, but I bet you I beat you in a fight. That, that's always <laughs> yeah. like the next, you know, cause it's just too like, Alpha's trying to go at it and someone has to win, someone has to lose kind of thing. And that's always like the next thing that we think about for the most part. That's how I know most wrestlers are. Yeah. Um, so I just figured, let me roll the dice, see what happens. It wasn't like I started with the goal of, Hey, I'm going to go to the UFC. I saw John Jones when I got to my senior year, mm -hmm. that's when the goals start to change. I told myself as soon as I'm done, cause I already had a couple pro fight, uh, amateur fights. I had seven at the time. Banged out seven amateur fights as a college student, full-time college student. I'm training full-time. I'm partying, but I'm, I'm managing the partying. Like, I, this is me knowing what I want already. Yeah. So I have my fun. I still try to live like a college kid, but for the most part, I'm still thinking long-term, short-term, five, five years, 10 years, what life could be if this ends up working out. If this worked. I see John Jones. He's in, in the UFC and got there in like six months. So I'm like, I don't know the, the recruitment process. But I know he whooped a lot of ass. Yeah, and he did it super quick. To have six fights in like six in six months is that's insane. There's yeah. not even a lot of people who are willing to do that in two years. Yeah, you know they want to take their time. This guy was just out there killing everybody. So I'm using him as my blueprint. Well, if I bang out a couple of fights and I look good doing it, and I win. Maybe I could go to the UFC too. Yeah, and I can make some money along the way because you get paid for it. Wasn't very much, but you get paid for it. So I'm thinking, where okay. Were your, where were your fights? Where, what, what? I fought in PA. I fought in New Hampshire. Um, I fought in New York on the Native American reservation and uh, New Jersey. Okay, cool. But these were just like one-off cards. This was not like. Yeah. So yeah. I would just take short notice fights, jump in here, jump in there. I'm just like, I didn't care. I'm young. Yeah. I feel like, I'm, I'm, like I'm invincible just <laughs> going after it. And sure enough, it worked out. And then as, like I said, as I went pro and I made that jump, it was at that moment where I said, okay, my college season is done for wrestling. I still got school, but this is what John did. Okay. How can we get there? Let's try to get these fights. And then when I had the first two, I was like, this is not as easy as he made it look. Cause he was able to just turn around and go, yeah. um, finding opponents, opponents pulling out, um, the weight cut. I don't know for him, it just seemed to be a lot easier. I, I was still cutting like 20. 25 pounds sometimes. Um, but I was still able to do it cause that was wrestling. That was wrestling for me. Cutting mm. 20 pounds a week was like normal. So I was able to make it a lot easier back then. And then after, you know, you have a couple of tough fights, um, a little bit of injuries here and there slowed down a bit. And then when I finally was eight, you know, so I finally got the call to the UFC on short notice. They told me I wasn't ready. Then I got what the call. Was, what was that moment? I was drinking a beer. I had <laughs> friends and family over Ugh. barbecue. They're like, yeah, we need you in 15 minutes. And then I'm like, like, sure. Okay. And I got off the phone. I, I give them my beer uh, to my, one of my good friends that I still talk to today. And I go, yo, finish this. And he go, what happened? I'm like, I just got the call, bro. I'm going to the UFC. I'm like, I'm about to go for a run right now. That was like one of the greatest moments for me. Um, went for like a, I think like a 20, 25 minute run just to break the sweat, get the alcohol out of my yeah. system a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was pumped, you know? So, but that, that was the goal. It became to get to the UFC. And then once that finally happened, then, you know, the goals, they slowly start to change. Every year you start to check things off. You start to move that goalpost, add new things, take some things out. And you look back and you're like, you see all the things you've covered and you're like, damn. Well, let's talk. I want to talk about that first fight, man. I want to talk about because you're going, you fought these regional promotions. But I mean, yeah. we're, I mean, <laughs> Indian Reservation, we're talking about what? Maybe 2000 people max. How many people are we talking yeah, not very much. Not very many. The, the gates were gym, not huge, gym, right? Cafeteria. <laughs> okay, there you go. Like, so where they're gonna have like wrestling tomorrow night right behind you, like pro wrestling's yeah. gonna be there. So the first fight, man, where was it? How many people? 
my first amateur fight or pro? no 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 UFC. I'm talking about oh, you, UFC. You got the call. Ah wow. You get the call. First UFC fight was here in Vegas, Mandalay Bay. At Mandalay Bay. UFC 170, Ronda Rousey versus Sarah McMahon, Daniel Cormier versus Pat Cummings. Um, so, yeah. so you work, you work your camp before the fight. Yeah. Now I, now I, th- I don't know if this is, I don't know if I, I heard this and I don't know if it's right or not, or if it's real, but I heard like, dude, you're a one man show. Like you are your own team. Like you, you handle all your shit. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, but I want to be careful the way I say that. Okay. Just so no one takes offense. No, 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 no. I, there are people that help, help me, you, but in the sense of organizing my training schedule, yes. um, for the most part, now I kind of leave the diet star stuff to the UFC when it gets closer to the fight. Got it. But outside of that, it's mostly me. Um, and trying to find training partners, I guess that's mostly me as well. And holding myself accountable to my training sessions, I guess is me. And, yeah. and so I guess in that sense, my strength and conditioning, I was doing that. Now for this fight, mm-hmm. this next one that's coming up, mm-hmm. I'm leaving that to the UFC to help me build a strength program to develop strength. Okay. Um, to get ready to go up a weight class to 145, just because the way I did it was more for weight loss, yeah. um, muscle conditioning. You just figured you've done it for so long. You knew your body, you knew what you needed better than anybody else would. Yeah. And I, I coach, yeah. I wrestle, I was a physical education major. So I had experience in that. You know, I've taken the anatomy, A, a and P one and two. I've taken the biomechanics classes, the exercise physiology class. And we have to come up with these systems or plans to kind of dictate what would you do if you were a phys ed teacher and you want to develop this for this kid or yeah. that for that kid, you have to come up with the plan based on the stuff that they teach us. Yeah. You have to base it around that. And that helped me kind of figure out, well, I know what we did for wrestling because my coach put us through these programs with the SNC coach mm-hmm. and I could take this, this works. And I know I'm trying to do this so I could kind of just make my own little thing. And it worked. And it just worked. And it worked. It worked. I still think to this day still works. Yeah. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Right. But now I need to change it up because I'm trying to now. You're trying to move the weight class. Yeah. All right. So. Well, let's, well, let's back up again. So, so you, you're, you're at UFC, the first fight, the Ronda Rousey fight. Yeah. And you're sitting there. You go through your camp, you do your thing, you get to the, you get to the, when does it get, I mean, real, was it like the weigh in? Was it like in the back watching the monitor waiting for them to call your name? Was it when you went through the curtain? Was it like, when was the holy shit moment? Cause there had to have been at least one. Uh, the first time, the first time is probably when I saw Daniel Cormier in the workout room, <laughs> we're both losing weight together. He's doing his hitting pads. And I'm just like, that's Daniel Cormier. This guy <laughs> right. wrestled in the Olympics. Yeah. This guy's the man, a, you know? Yeah. And I saw Ronda Rousey. I saw Sarah McMahon. She also wrestled in the Olympics. I believe, I think she was a silver or a bronze medalist. So there was a lot of like fanboy moments for me. Yeah. But then I, I even told myself then I was like, when you get here, you got to remember that you are now the guy. Act like you belong. Yeah. Act like you belong here. You're the guy also. Mm-hmm. And or as my grandmother used to say, act like you've been somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I Even to this day, man, I still see fighters. It'll be their debut. They'll come up and it just look like they're like a deer in headlights. And they're just <laughs> walking around like, yeah. I'm like, yo, bro, don't look like that guy. Like, don't. it's okay to, to have them to feel that emotion. I'm like, not, I'm not saying don't address it. That's real. Yeah. But. You know, show like you, like, you know, show your, like your peacock feathers, you know? Yeah, put it out. I mean, I just, for me, man, it's like every time I go to like, I have really good seats for the nights, right? Like so for the really low, they're kind of from right down by the ice. So when the crowd really pops, dude, you're close enough to the ice where you feel it. Yeah. And I can't even imagine what it's like being in the center of that, having all that noise concentrated at you. It's nuts. It's not. <laughs> I mean, it's just got to be just just ground shaking. So that that first fight comes off. You win the first fight. I won the first ones. Um, twenty nine, twenty eight. Cody Gibson. He also took it on short notice. Um, now this is Mandalay Bay. This is the. It's in Vegas. Yeah, so the dude. the arena is never really filled here in the states, mm-hmm. especially in Vegas. People are like out partying and yeah. drinking events, and then they come there usually for the main card. Yep. So after the fights, then I then go to the crowd because they give us tickets. And I got to watch this thing fill out. And that was probably one of the best experiences kind of seeing like one day I'm gonna I, fill, I believe I'm this, this is going to be going to be me. And it's just crazy going from curtain jerker. Um, I mean, we weren't the very first fighter tonight, but we might, we, it was close. It was close, <laughs> you know? So to go from that to headlining to pay-per-view cards, I, I feel like that was like the culmination of everything finally coming together. So that's, 
it, it's unreal, man. You're in the center, main event, where the people are booing for you, cheering for you. It's yeah. it's an unreal feeling, and it's nerve wracking, but it's also exciting at the same time. Especially my last one uh, with the O'Malley fight. Yeah, I knew I was going into enemy territory. I'm taking it all in. Like, uh, okay, so, so okay, so the, can we, can we ta- I, I, we we're going to get there eventually. But since you brought it up, we'll talk about it right now. So, so yeah. how? I mean, okay, how does that pitch go from Dana to you? Like, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> We want you to fight this cat and we're going to do it in his hometown in front of all of his people. And even if it's not his hometown, it's a, it's a, as many Irish people as we can fi- fit into an arena. It's like, yeah. we want you to fight Conor McGregor. We're going to do it in Dublin. It's yeah. essentially what happened. How does that conversation go? Or can you even, if I ask something's crazy, you can't talk about yeah, yeah, that. You no, feel free to tell me no. We actually didn't even have a conversation after I just beat Henry Ciuto, two division champion. Yeah. Just coming out of retirement. Um, you know, I beat him by split decision, even though I thought it was, I thought I clearly won, but, um, split decision win. And <laughs> to go from that, to go from that high and then feeling like you're going to finally get like to decompress. And then a couple hours later, you hear that Dana White makes an announcement that you're going to be fighting in three and a half months. And I'm just like, bro, I could barely even walk right now. What are yeah. you talking about? Like, at least check on me first. Yeah. That's, that was my whole thing with that situation. Um, but it, it was a tough f- scenario. Like I, I took it for financial reasons, clearly. Yeah. Cause yeah. anybody else in their right mind is going to be like, if there's, you remove the money, you're just going to be like, dude, I physically can't, I can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. But me, I like to push the envelope and just see what I can do. And if I was to win in that situation, Man, I, honestly, I would have been walking around like the man. Like I, you, like you couldn't have told me anything yeah, just dude. because I just I know what it took to get into that fight. I knew what it took for me just to get there. Yeah, not in the sense of like all the other stuff. I'm talking about from my health perspective, just to get to the fight. There was so much behind the scenes nonsense that people could say whatever they want about calling it an excuse. It's not an excuse. It's, these are actual factual things that happen. I think everyone's seen that Dana White turned this fight around really quick to give this guy an advantage, to give him an advantage from a weight cut standpoint, an injury standpoint, a home, t- a home field advantage for people standpoint. I mean, that stuff doesn't bother me. The only thing that really was the, the, the worst part for me was just my, my legs being beat up. Yeah. And from a physical standpoint, like how am I supposed to kick a bag? How am I supposed to kick pads? And I can't even train. If I can't train, I'm at a very big disadvantage coming out of the gate. Um, so that was the only thing that was a little bit tough about that. Other than that, I felt like any other day on a regular situation, like situation, I think that fight's completely different. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I, I think it, again, back to, back to that home court advantage deal, dude, it's gotta be like, like you look at like pro wrestling, right? Like whatever those dudes are out there playing a role. Right. They're acting, they're playing a role and they're designed to get the crowd to boo them and hate them and scream at them or whatever the fuck they're going to do. Right. But when you're like a real dude, (laughs) and you go out there and you you don't always get the crowd. Right. Depending on where you are, where your opponent, who your opponent is, where where they are, whatever. Obviously, you were not going to get the crowd in that O'Malley fight. There was zero (laughs) chance you were going to get the crowd. (laughs) Does that Fuck. I mean, it's on some level. Do you, are you able to block that out or does it fuck with you on some level? Cause I don't, for me, yeah, for me, I block it out. It's not a, that does, that stuff doesn't bother me. Like I look at it as even during COVID people were complaining about no fans in the arena, like the athletes. Yeah. And I, and I simply just put it out there and I go, well, if you're in a back alley and someone's trying to mug you, it's just you and him and there's nobody watching do you what are you going to cheer for? You, you need a cheerleader <laughs> to get up and fight. Yeah. Like I, I'm confused. This yeah. that that mindset doesn't make any sense. So now you 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 have the fans. You you're in the enemy territory. You knew this going in. I knew that going in. Yeah. I knew that going into my last three four fights. Since my first PDON fight, where I got illegally needed, and then I somehow overnight became the bad guy. Yeah, because you won for the front line on the DQ, right? Yeah, you need you but it wasn't even the DQ. People were mad at they they swear. That after the DQ, I fake they they think I faked the concussion, but they're not even mad about that. Yeah, they think because they think I faked the concussion and then I went out partying, they think 
That's what I did. Yeah, but if the rules say you can't get kneed in the head, that's has not. I mean, should it yeah. matter if you got a concussion or not? <laughs> it, it sh- that part shouldn't matter, right. but for the fans, it does. Okay, and I and I understand. All right, but never faked anything. I never partied. I never posted anything. I had friends and family that came out to watch me. That flew all the way out, spent thousands of dollars to come watch me fight. Tickets, mm. flights, hotel rooms, yeah. and they're all at my house. I had maybe 40, 50 people at my house coming to just see me, check on me after that whole crappy fight went down. Yeah. And uh, we did a toast. There was no partying. And somehow I'm, I became the bad guy. Because there's one photo of you. Because my teammates did it. it. They posted it. And I guess they took that as, oh, he's an actor. He was faking the whole time. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm in the bathroom fucking throwing up. And this is yeah. what you guys are saying? Like, this is what you're that's, telling. That pissed, that pissed me off. So when people started doing that, they started saying that. I kind of ran with it and started like, Playing the heel even more. Well, like, let, well, let me ask you. Let me let me ask you this, man. What's better fuel for for Aljo? Is it the is it is it the is it the cheers from the crowd or is it the fucking hate? You just turn that into into rocket fuel, or do you just block it both all of it out when, when you're in the moment? Um, when I'm in the moment, that's a good question. I don't I don't know. I feel like both have like their. I'm I when I wrestled in high school and I wrestled in college, we have these things called dual meets. Okay, individual weight classes. The best guy is supposed to go out and wrestle their best guy at the weight. Sometimes people would avoid each other because they they don't want to risk losing too early in the season because then it could be held against them when it comes to rankings and seedings in the tournament mm-hmm. for the national tournament. It's a whole game. So whenever I'm up, the guy before me or the guy after me, I don't care. If the guy loses before me or wins before me, I'm getting I'm getting pumped up the same exact way. Yeah. He lost. Fuck! I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I gotta go get this back for my team. Yeah. He wins. Hell yeah! Let's fucking go. I gotta keep this momentum going for my team. This is just the way I think. I turn anything from a negative into a positive. Yeah. Positive. I just make it an extra positive. Um, it does. So it doesn't really matter. Like so, from a cheering or booing standpoint, I'm gonna use that energy to fuel me no matter what. Whether you're you're there for me. Thank you. I, I love that energy. Yeah. If you're not there for me, okay, I'm gonna make you mad. <laughs> Somehow, I'm some way, send you home in tears, and, and, and that's it. That's the way I, I channel that energy. It's not like it happens, and then I'm like in my head, like, oh man, I can't believe the people are mad at me. Yeah. Uh, like that stuff don't bother me. Not not when I'm in the middle of the octagon. I'm, I'm here to fight. You're here to cheer. Roman Gladiator days. Yeah. And hey, you better win, or you're going. You're you're going probably getting fed to the lions or something, or you're getting killed. What, what's the, to this to to date right now? What's the what is the most memorable experience, either good or fucking negative with a fan that you've had or, or a not fan? What's, what is good or negative with a fan? Yeah. Um, a fan, what's called okay. a fan, fan of the UFC, not necessarily a fan of yours. It can the be either rematch, way. The rematch with Piotr Jan that I had. Okay. This was in Jacksonville. Now, I won by split decision after just coming off of a neck surgery and – Whatever. I, I've been in a long training camp because, mind you, after the surgery in April, everything is PT every single day, trying to get back, trying to get healthy, trying to get strong, and then jumping right into a training camp. So it took me a year to get back till I felt good enough where I could compete. Yeah. Okay, so now we're here, Jacksonville. I'm getting booed in the States. I'm fighting a Russian <laughs> during the Russian-Ukraine war that just started. You're like, haven't you people seen Rocky? What's wrong with you, dude? You're not supposed to boo me. What's going on? It was the most bizarre thing. That was one of the things. I, I made sure I picked a walkout song. <laughs> What'd you walk out that to? no one could boo. <laughs> it was uh, Peppa's Faruka, whatever it's called. <laughs> um, really fun song, popular yeah. nightclub song. And uh, when, this, when the song came on and my... F- Face hit the screen. Everyone started booing right away. <laughs> ah, you actor. Ah. But as the beat picks up, I can hear the boos and like they kind of change and people are kind of like confused. Like, well, yeah. do we boo this or I'm do we cheer like for this? Song. Yeah, like you like the song. It's, this is a feel good song. You should have come out to like Hulk Hogan's I'm a Real American theme this, song. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> how, how are you going to boo that? Yeah. Or just, just straight up the national anthem. Just walk <laughs> out to That it. would have been the funniest thing. Actually, I, I don't even know why out. I didn't think of that. Just walk out to the national anthem. That would have been, that would have been hilarious. Yeah. Like, you guys are booing the American? You can't do that. On American soil? Yeah, that's crazy. That's, Did you expect it? Uh, I expected I expected animosity. Okay. But to that level... But then once it changed, I was like, 
I was like, I'm looking around the crowd, like, yeah, yeah you guys like yeah, this. You guys like this. Yeah. Like, you, you can do all you want, but I know your foot staff. Yeah, I know, I know your foot staff. Right yeah, like, I know it is. <laughs> boo, we're so confused. <laughs> and uh, later that night, there was a fan. He bet money. I guess because of my fight, he lost. And I won by split. Mm-hmm. He sees me at the hotel. I guess his six thousand dollar bet would have been a million dollars. He showed his he showed his um, bet slip or whatever online. Should have bet or whatever. against me. <laughs> and that's what I said. I was like, bro, I was a bigger, I was the biggest underdog on the yeah. entire card, and you bet for this guy. I think yeah. so. For him to bet for Piotr Jan, he was all pissed. So he saw me at the hotel, and he starts like, boo, like doing this weird thing. And I was like, okay. I, I get you. it, whatever you're Thank mad. You. Like, yeah, enough. I'm just coming off of an adrenaline dump because I'm like, all right, finally, the monkey's off my back. Yeah. I won the rematch. Suck it to the whole world. <laughs> and everyone said, Piotr Jan by whatever he wants. He's going to dominate. He's going to kill him. Oh, uh, he was dog walking him. He doesn't have a chance. What's he going to do this time? I beat the guy and there's all these excuses. <laughs> ah, no, you did this. I'm, yeah. Like, bro. So he had this, allergies in Florida. Did you see the pollen down there? He crazy. didn't have a chance. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so pretty much that guy was, an, uh, he was an asshole. And then I saw him the next day and he was doing the same thing. And now, now it's a different day. Yeah. Fight's over. Your, your time of being a fan in the, in the arena. Yeah. Now we're just in the hotel. Now yeah. you're being a prick. Now you're being a complete <laughs> douche. And I saw him at the arena on my way out. He started doing the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Boo. Like making his face like, you ah, boo. And I'm walking out. I'm just clapping. I'm just like, yeah. Like just, yeah. I'm playing into it. Like you're a fan. I don't know what's going on. Sure. You're probably upset. Clearly you're upset. Cause you thought you had a million dollars in the back. Sure. You should never bet against me. <laughs> and uh, that's on you. And uh, then I see him at the hotel. He does it again. Then the next day, that was the third time I was just like, all right. So now I pressed him and I'm like, yo, bro, this is a different day. Like you got to stop this shit because yeah. now you're in my personal space yeah. and this is something completely different. So if you want me to react a different way, you're going to get that reaction. I'm just letting you know, this is not going to end pretty. I was like, if you want to sue, go ahead and fucking sue. I'm gonna, It's going to be worth every single fucking penny. What did he say to that? So then he was just kind of like, he kind of started backing down. And then my, my teammates came out. It's like, yo, don't touch him. This is what he wants. And then. They started fucking with him. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> so my, one, of my, one of my teammates grabs the coffee cup out of the one kid's hand. And he's like, what are you going to He has no voice because he's screaming the whole sure. time. Like, it was an insane night. He, he grabs the coffee cup. He's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to I'll fucking kill you. I'll fucking fuck you. <laughs> it was the funniest thing because I'm watching on the side. I was like, yeah, fuck that kid. Fuck that kid. <laughs> like, you're being an asshole, man. Um, you're like, you deserve this. And his friends didn't want nothing. He wanted no parts of it. He's like, bro, it's not us. It's no, him. Like, Sorry, dude. Yeah, it's just yeah. out of control. Oh, that was like terrible. the worst experience I've had. I would say like, Face to face where he, someone actually had balls to actually say something. But then he became polite later on. And he was just like, nah, man, I just got to just want to ask, did you really feel like you want to fight? And I'm just looking at him like, like I'm like, going to say no. Like, I'm glad like you're you, going to say no. Glad you like chilled out. But that's a dumbass yeah. question. I'm like, please show me where he won the fight. I yeah. was like, that, what, but whatever. That's obviously six. Everybody's always got an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay. At, at what point, man, did you realize like I'm famous. Like at what, like, like at what point did something happen where you were like, holy shit, like I'm famous. <laughs> uh, I think the <clears throat> Pedro Munoz fight that was in 2019. Mm-hmm. And then I had to take a year out to fix my wrist. That was a year in recovery. And then after I finished Sanhagen the way I did in 2020, that was like less than two minutes. And he was like the next coming of Moses to walk on water. Yeah. And, um, killed the guy in less than two minutes. So I think after that, everything catapulted and snowballed. And then I had the first Piotr Jan fight. So I was like, that was like a, a pick em type of fight yeah, because yeah. no one knew they saw how good I was. And then I have a shit fight like that against this guy. And then I come back and beat him. So that's around that time frame. I want to say 2019 was like starting to pick up 2020 became like another level. And then after the, the rematch with Piotr Jan, I think it got a little bit higher after that. And then, um, of course, now after this last one with O'Malley, I think when you sit on top for so long, now you're on the pay-per-views, your co-main event, your main event, yeah. back-to-back. Uh, you start to get a little bit more notoriety and things like that, and you're, you're doing more stuff. And I think you're, the advertisement, advertisements of you just start to circulate a little bit more. Yeah. I, I think it, it, it's funny what you said, because, you know, in, in boxing – 
the promoters will, will protect fighters yeah. as they bring them along. In UFC, I don't, from the outside looking in, I, you know, I don't know how much of that there really is. It doesn't seem like there. It seems like they move people up pretty quick to put them in. How bad does it seem to screw up their plans behind the bull, behind the scenes when like you, you dust one of their golden boys is coming up? It's is a, that is that a, my, is, is that a problem. weird situation? <laughs> All right, cool. No, no. Is is there like a? Can you feel kind of the oh shit that just happened when in, in a situation like you just described? Yeah, yeah. It's always like win win though because yeah. they know who they want to win. Yeah, and they kind of do like their whole war room thing where they kind of like pick their X's and O's. Like, well, if he wins here, this puts him here. Then this is what we think that's going to happen, and yeah. we'll do this, and we can slide him into this position. But then it's on the athlete to win. Yeah. Um. So I think when you're pissing the Cheerios and you mess with the plans, they just have to go to plan B. And sometimes they really don't have a plan B for you. And that's where I think the business side comes into it. It's like, they can like you as an athlete, yeah. but when it comes to the business, if you're not good for business, good for their bottom line, then it's kind of like, well, you're cool, but we kind of need to slice someone else in your position. So and enjoy see. it while it lasts kind of a thing. You know, and, and, I, and I do, we're going to transition the conversation from fighting into business because I know that's something that's very passionate with, with you. And, and you've obviously been one of those people that, you know, you, you hear the stories of athletes making a bunch of bank and being broke five minutes later. I mean, the money yeah. that Tyson burned through, the money that Allen Iverson burned through and like just Im- amazing sums of money they burned up. And I, I'm guessing at a pretty early point, you know, again, you, you have an accounting degree. You decided that's not going to be me. Phys ed. Phys ed. I'm sorry, phys yeah, ed, yeah, but I you switched, took accounting before. Over. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But you you, t- you had an understanding of basic accounting that you yeah. probably said this is never going to be me. Yeah. I And uh, I look at other people and learn from their mistakes. I yeah. think that's the best way I could put it. I've always said, why do we have, I, my brothers and I would talk and I always just, I would always say to them, even my friends, and I'll go, why do we have to make the same mistakes as everybody else? I don't understand the world, how it operates in this manner. Like we see the same thing repeating itself over and over and over. And it's just like, to me, well, why aren't we learning from those mistakes so that history doesn't repeat itself yeah. so that we could do things a little bit smarter or better. And I think I've been able to at least learn from my, my ancestors in the sense of fighting, mm-hmm. learn from these guys, the forefathers and things that they did, things that worked Oh, less damage, longer career, wrestling. Yeah. Okay, if I can get the fight, get the, f- the finishes, fan favorite. That's what people want to see. So you learn from these things. You learn from the things that they do. You see the guys who go broke. Well, how did he go broke? He had million, over $100 million. How on earth is it possible to go broke in such a short amount of time? <laughs> I know it's possible, but yeah. how? Like, yeah. what, what were you possibly doing? It was it just one large purchase? Was it just multiple things? <laughs> it's like John Daly, I guess, blew through like 50 or 60 yeah. bucks. Like how many Hooters chicken wings can you eat, dude? I mean, it's just, it's not even possible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's crazy. Have they done a better job at the UFC of trying to set, like, do they, is there any type of, like in the NFL, they started the NFL rookie symposium where they bring people in and they're like, okay, you know, dipshits. If you want to buy a car, fine. Don't buy 10. Right. Like we don't want you to be broke in three years. And they started trying to bring into the rookies uh, some sort of financial, you know, talk, because a lot of these guys have never even had conversations like that. Yeah. Does UFC do anything like that at all? So they've mm-hmm. done something in the past. We call the they call it the athlete retreats. I only remember them doing two of them, though. I went to both. And um, I think now they're trying to do some stuff here in Vegas when people come in, I think they might have done another one. It was like a small, short function, but I don't remember it being that in depth with financial solutions or what an LLC is or S corp and that type of stuff. Um, how to protect your assets? Yeah, making sure you put aside money for your taxes, win or lose. Um, how to account for your expenses going into a fight camp? There's a lot that goes. Like I truly do think accounting helped me mm. with that. If I never taken the accounting class, I would never have, I wouldn't think like that. Yeah. I think that's what helped me in that sense. Um, I do think the UFC should do a little bit more of that. The only thing is maybe they should put the course out on video. And this way it's not like they need to spend a bunch of money every single time to hold these events for. Yeah. yeah just here's, 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 a re- here's a resource. Yeah. Here's a resource. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier trying to budget for, for training camps and do those things. I mean, I've heard that, like, for those low-card fighters, I mean, you can literally lose money on a fight. Oh, yeah. Well, 
And see, that was the thing. When I came in, I made eight and eight, 8,000 to show up, make weight and another 8,000 if I won. Yeah. So with that being said, and this is UFC. You made that money. UFC. Yeah. Wow. Um, that was in 2014. Is it a gradual climb in money or is it a quantum leap when you go from the bottom to the top? So I went from eight and eight, my first fight, my first contract actually was for four fight deal, eight and eight, 10 and 10, 12 and 12, 14 and 14. And I fought my deal out because I just figured to roll the dice and see how much more money I could get. They typically tend to renegotiate when you have one or two fights left on the contract. Um, that was standard practice. I don't know if things have changed. And with that said, when I made the eight and eight, uh, if I had lost and I just got my 8,000, I, I was at least smart enough or maybe bold enough to take the chance in all those fights where I didn't, I didn't have any physical therapy. I'm not saying this is good. I'm just saying this is just the things that I did to help me get by. I wasn't going to fancy restaurants. Mm. Um, I didn't buy a whole bunch of new gear. I was using a lot of hand-me-down stuff. And fortunately for me, it just worked out where my expenses in the very beginning weren't very huge. Um, I didn't have a ton of overhead. I was still living at my house with my parents um, before the divorce and uh, was able to save money on rent that way mm -hmm. before I had to eventually move out. Then I started taking in extra expenses in New York, which is very expensive. Yeah. Uh, so when you start to account for those things, recovery stuff, whether it's a sauna, or physical therapy, um, dry needling, all the stuff that at high level athletes should be able to have access to and should be able to afford to do no problem, like comfortably. Yeah. Um, so you could go, you could go negative on a fight really quickly, especially if you don't win, especially in the very beginning of your career, if yeah. you're not careful of how much you're, you're spending. And then so, of course you got to pay your coaches. So a lot of those early card dudes, they have other jobs. <laughs> yeah. I had, a, I was a gym teacher the whole time until I think I was working in phys ed all the way to 2017 where I won two fights back to back. And I was like, okay, now I got a little bit of, of a breather and I can pull back and, uh, focus on just fighting as a full-time athlete. So now that you, now that you're making real money, I guess I should say, I mean, you're on top of those cards. You're making, you're making real money to fight now. What are some things that you started to do to diversify your money? Yeah. Not everyone is just cause they're on the top of the card. Doesn't mean they're making real money though. Just okay, fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm in a different situation because as, as a former champ defended consecutive uh, times, it starts to go up every single time. Mm. But then as you lose the belt, you go back to what we call, um, like your regular pay, your standard pay, but you have your championship pay and you have your challenger pay. And now I no longer have access to pay-per-view points on my contract. So there's little perks of becoming a champ and sometimes you lose it. And when you do, you lose some of those, those things as well. Yeah. Um, but now some of the things I diversify myself with is real estate. Mm -hmm. um, I have three houses. I'm actually partnering up with Jason on one more. And yep. then I got one more in the pipeline. So I sh I'm hoping to have five single family houses. And I, I want to eventually get into multifamily because yep. I think that's where real wealth can come in from versus the single family homes because there's a little bit more work in, in that. It's a little bit more work intensive in terms of turnover and things like that, vacancy. And then I'm also in the stock market as, as well. And I have my retirement accounts and things like that. Cool. Another question, because very much like you handle your own kind of stuff there, do you have a financial advisor that you trust to, to help you pick stocks? Or is this something that you are personally interested in? I was personally interested. <laughs> that's a different, that's a different world. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time for that, man. So yeah. I, I, I got my financial advisor, Aaron Freeman. He's over at Janie Montgomery Scott. Um, they do a very good job. The, the people that he puts me in line and in, in touch with to handle my assets. And one of the things I do now, like even I think the last four fights, man, five, as soon as I get paid, I pay my coaches right away. Yeah. I budget for taxes. I take my 30% out right away because I'm going to have expenses. So I would imagine my expenses would at least be enough where I'm not putting 37 or 35% away for my S corp. So I, 30% is reasonable and then the rest is my money. But then for the most, for the most part, the, my money part, I split that in half and I put that almost all into my retirement, Yeah, retirement, SEPT IRAs. And, uh, um, are you buying property in, in your, do you have a Roth IRA? Yes. 
I have a Roth. I have. Are you two buying property IRAs. within? Are you buying property in those IRAs? In the IRAs, I haven't. Yeah. What I'm in the IRAs, no. It's great tax deferment. You might want to might want to talk to your guy about that. Yeah. About utilizing those funds to actually invest because it'll grow faster than it will probably just in in whatever standardized stuff you're investing in now. Okay, probably. that's good. To, yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, All there right. you go. Um, I want to talk some rum though, man, because I hear I hear there's a new spirit brewing out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me about the rum, dude. So I'm waiting for that. We're working on the label. Once the label is done, we can submit that to the TTB, okay. and then from there we should be good to go and official to start taking sales and things like that. This is something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. One of my vices, I drink, man. <laughs> I, I drink. And it's, it's one of my, it's like my happy place yeah. outside of fighting for whatever reason. Obviously not to a point where it's damaging anything. No, of You're course. fine. Yeah. 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 So if there's anything I do, I do enjoy, some people enjoy a blunt. Some people enjoy just to hit a bong. Yeah. Some people enjoy edibles. Some people enjoy mushrooms. I enjoy drinking. Yeah. That's just, what I'm into. Yeah. Um, and my, my parents are Jamaican. So this is one of the things I've always wanted to do. I have wanted to get into a rum spirit. Um, rum is very heavily favored in Jamaica mm -hmm. and it just makes the most sense. And so far the product, I, I don't want to, I don't want to oversell, but okay. I'm, I'm telling people. No, nah, man, dude, I, you got to oversell it, dude. I think it's going to be today. really damn good. I think the people out there who are already on the market, they, they're going to have a, uh, the new guy in town is coming. Man, right, dude, so. <laughs> listen, listen, if you can pull off a spirit, I'll tell you a story. If you can pull off a spirit, and this should motivate you. A buddy of mine, uh, we were on the same reality show a million years ago. He was on the season before me, but it was a guy that I knew. And uh, at some point several years ago, he goes, I'm going to start a liquor company. And we all thought he was batshit crazy. We're like, what are L you talking liquor about? Liquor company? Or, no, no, no. I'm going to start a spirit company. Sorry. Oh, okay. not liquor, a spirit, a spirit company. And he said, I'm going to bring back the spirit that's been dead in America for like 80 years. And it was rye. And I was like, who the fuck is going to drink rye whiskey? Yeah. That brand's whistle pig. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So him. yeah. Good for him. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Raj did quite well with the old whistle big brand. So dude, I wish you so much. I wish you so, so well with that brand. I hope it goes amazingly well, but I want to finish this up talking about uh, something else. Cause I think part of being a champion, which obviously you are is the ups and downs of it. Yeah. And I want to talk real quick again. I know we talked a little bit about it, the O'Malley fight, but I want to talk about the mentality right after it of you losing the belt and what it, the period of getting your mind right, if there was one and where your mentality is going forward to get back to where you work Because every great athlete I know doesn't like, once you, once you sit atop the throne, my man, I, I got to believe you ain't real happy if you're not sitting there now. Yeah. Um, my mentality after losing the fight, I was relieved. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Relieved in, not in a sense of like losing the belt, relieved that I was, I didn't have to fight anytime soon again. Yeah. Because that was the crux going into that fight was I had to figure out how to mentally switch <coughs> that my legs are banged up. I still have some injury. My wrist is fucked up. My, my neck, I had so much going on my bicep, but I'm just like, after the Henry fight, I wanted my downtime. Yeah. I didn't get my downtime. So it was like, I got to enjoy maybe like a week or two of hanging out with my friends and family. Then it was back to trying to do recovery and trying to heal up as fast as I could to make the fight happen for the fans. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day it was for me, but it was also for the fans. Yeah. Cause I could have just been like, cause I was told if I didn't fight, I wouldn't be able to fight till January, February. I could be like, well, see you guys next year. Yeah. I could have done that. And I thought about it. Mm -hmm. I even told my manager at the time, I said, yo, you know what? I'm just going to just chill. And kind of got co coerced by him and, you know, talking to a few other people and we kind of had like the pros and cons. So then after the fight being over, it was just a big relief to just have a mental relaxation. Whereas like, you mean to tell me no one's going to try to punch me anytime soon and I could just <laughs> yeah. relax? Yeah, I can literally turn my, I can turn my phone off right now. And, and just live like a regular person. That's yeah. all I wanted. Yeah. I asked for an extra month just so I can have this taken care of so that I can train right out of the gate going like the way I normally do. Yeah. But I wasn't granted that. And unfortunately for me, but fortunate for them, you know, their guy won good for him. You know, you know, when they say anytime, any place, anywhere, um, that's one of those situations. 
You know, so for him, that place, that time, it worked out in his favor, yeah. you know? And that's why I do feel like if, if it was a different time, it would have been a little bit more in my favor because now you have a, a more level playing field. I just felt like the scale was a little bit more tipped into his favor. Yeah. And of course he's good. Yeah. But when you're good and you have a little bit more things on your side, it makes it a little bit easier for you to make those things work out. So after the fight, very relieved. I, I All I thought about was where we were going to go on vacation. We literally were probably out of the country for like nine weeks, my fiance and I. So we got to go to Australia, to the Sydney card, got to watch Sean Strickland versus um, Israel Adesanya. Oh, that's awesome. Went to Bali, Indonesia, got to surf again, um, vacation, literally wake up and train, have a beer, go surfing, or go out and party and eat as much food as I want to. Got to just relax and be a normal human being for three weeks in Bali, hanging yeah. out. Then we went to Wales. Um, I had a grappling match that I just randomly took. Um, probably not the smartest thing because you just stayed for three weeks. <laughs> I, I was like, bro, I haven't trained. And I told these, there's like, yeah, it's just a grappling match. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to lose. I'm like, but they, they told me, Oh, well pay for your whole vacation. I was like, I just, you literally, I just literally just, you just put me that, that, that movie, the great white hype with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, Damon Wayans or whatever. Yeah. He's like, you're not in shape. He's like, I am in shape. I'm round. <laughs> round is a shape. <laughs> round is a shape. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, we went to London, came back to, to the States and then we went to Amsterdam for two days, came back, went to Abu Dhabi for about two weeks. Um, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. And I came back, went to Mexico for a wedding. And then when I was done, it's like when I when, when I got to the Mexico part of the trip, that's when I was kind of like starting to miss training. Yeah. Like, man, I kind of want to get back and get ready to compete. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I've been wanting so that I could be just mentally fresh and have a clean say. And then this way I could kind of get ready to get back after it. But um, so what's the, what's the goal now, Mr. I write them down. Where, where are we at? Are you are you going back after O'Malley or are you moving up in weight? No, they already made the fight. Mm -hmm. I already knew they were going to make the fight with him and Cheeto. They were mm -hmm. going to skip over my guy, Marab. Um, to make that rematch happen. Um, so it is what it is. I think it's going to be a great fight either way. Mm -hmm. Like, I know some people might think I'm still salty, but I really don't care. I made my money. Um, I accomplished what I accomplished. There's nothing to be salty about. Yeah. Um, all I said is I just wish I got a fair shake on the fight. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is. I took the fight. No one put a gun to my head to make me take it. You know, they dangled the carrot, but I took the carrot, you know? So it is what it is. And um, now it's just getting ready for the next one. Hopefully it's in March or here. Same way, same way, same way class. Or you moving no, up? I'm going up. You're moving up. 145. Okay. Yeah. So that's the plan right now. I was trying to get the Max Holloway fight. Um, probably not going to happen, but we'll see. Um, if not, maybe Calvin Cater. Okay. So how many, how many fights do you think you need to win at that weight class before they give you a shot at the gold? Two? One or two. Yeah, I think it just depends on who I fight, and it depends on who wins between Volkanovski and Taporia. And how it looks. Um, how it looks. I think it could open up the doors for me really quickly. If Alex wins, I think it, it's more in my favor. And then if I come in and I could win one, I think it's definitely in my favor because Alex pretty much beat everybody already. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on how that looks and how that works out and uh, just go from there. Well, I love it, man. Well, uh, dude, I'm a fan. Best of luck to you on those fights. And dude, when the rum comes out, you'll have to bring it back by. We'll oh, have a sure. taste test to try <laughs> to sell some bottles for you, man. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool, brother. Appreciate you. And guys, we will see you next week. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of Escaping the Drift. Hope you got a bunch out of it, or at least as much as I did out of it. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the show, you can always go over to escapingthedrift.com. You can join our mailing list. But do me a favor, if you wouldn't mind, throw up that five-star review. Give us a share. Do something, man. We're here for you. Hopefully, you'll be here for us. But anyway, in the meantime, we will see you at the next episode. <laughs>